Hi, Paul. How, how, was it? how are you going? You okay? Yeah, 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 fine. You? Yeah, too bad. Um, as normalities, I know you're in, Bra you're in Brighton, aren't you? So yeah. uh, I'm in Wales. So we've got, we come out of some sort of lockdown ish. So we're allowed to go to the pub within. How are you? Well, we could go to the pub, but not meet anybody. <laughs> yeah. So at my age, that's about right, I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm 47, so yeah, I'm, I'm about the same. Yeah, yeah. You're ready, to sit, you're ready to sit at the back on your own. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I saw the film last night, Concrete Plans. Um, I kept it. To, I, I kept it to watch last night. So when we spoke now, I'm gonna be quite fresh in my mind. Um, but once I knew that you were involved with the music, it was a dead cert. I was going to watch it anyway, Great. Um, because I'm a big fan of Orbital and yourself. So um, and just ask you about the film then. What was the remit for you? You know, for, to write the music. Did, did they just say give you free reign to write? Give, give you like the uncut version. And you just give free reign to write the music, or did they sort of give you, um, you know? A, what they sort of want to for say the opening and the end credit and then doing the certain scenes for the film. No, I mean, apart from the sort of mood direction, mm. um, which is the key really stylistically, um, Will left me to my own devices. The only thing I would, oh, sorry, it's, a, it's okay. my, an alarm to tell me to have this interview, um, <laughs> but it's a bit late. <laughs> no, but he, um, he said, the, the, I'd say the only stylistic steer he gave me was he kept whispering the word kind of guitar, guitar every now and then. Um, so I kind of, you know, did it, um, I sort of wrote it all with sort of fake guitar here and there and that kind of thing um, with plans to get a friend of mine, Andy Britton, who's a really sort of great virtuoso guitar that I've used, guitar player that I've used before. And I right at the end to keep the cost down um, they found a bit of money to pay him. So I just went in the studio and, and recorded him for a day, which was a lovely sort of icing on the cake right at the end. Cause it sort of, you know, took you, I could take away all the fake guitar and put all the real one there. And it was really lovely. And it was great. It was a great moment actually for me and Will to both go, Oh, that's nice. That's great. You yeah, know, real yeah. sort of injection of, of freshness right at the end. So that was great. But you know, apart from that, stylistically, Will just said, do your thing do you know what i mean do what it is that you do that's why i'm asking you to do it he, you know he got me on board um through yestin george who was doing sort of music supervision on it okay early on you know at least a year before it was even starting to get made and we just used to meet have coffee or beer and just chat about you know hopefully getting the film off the ground so how many times did you watch it then did you you know did you watch it first or was it just you started working on the music and then you um you no, oftentimes with any kind of project like this, especially when you're in um, before it's even filmed, you tend to get to see bits as it, you know, as it comes along. So Will was sending me kind of daily sort of rushes um, yeah. now and then just to sort of get me into the spirit of it. Because I'd read the script, you know, at least a year before and a couple of revisions over the year and that kind of thing. So it was, you know, it was fascinating to watch it develop. But I tend to... Well, you can start writing with that kind of thing. And I did do a couple of grand gesture sort of themes early on, like the sort of, um, not the sort of spooky opening theme, but the sort of more sort of pastoral guitar-y kind of thing. I did that to some of the opening sequences um, just at the beginning and then cut it to, to fit the film. It was just, you know, just to try and get a shape for the main guy for, you know, like sort of a Victor's theme, if you like, and something that kind of conjured up the landscape. And, and and with the film then, um, how many sort of tracks did you write for it then? As a, as a, you know, I've seen all these different scenes in, but how many sort of tracks are on there? That I you, can you tell you exactly because I've been sat around working this all out to send it to my publisher. So I've got documents of it in front of me. Um, <laughs> about twenty six. Wow. Okay. And I say about because there were there was there was a couple of, you know, sort of one's chucked in like when you chuck a house between another house and it becomes 12a rather than 12 you know but yeah. around 26 bits of music it's a very impressive you know piece of work i mean i i like i said before I, I'm, I'm a big fan and um but i i it's just once i know that you're involved with the film and i i i can appreciate the film more because i know that obviously from your past catalog and you know with this style of music you've got out there and i, I think it just works and and it, and it was it's 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 very atmospheric sort of tracks on the on the on the on the, on the in the film. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I was about to say, but it just works, though, you know. And I mean, for a film that's so dark at times, 
you you add that sort of edge to it. I mean, it's you know at the opening, like you say, it's, and then goes what the the end credits. I feel a bit more how it ends, but obviously it's a bit more mallowish, I guess, towards the end. From the end, that's for me anyway. Yeah, well, it's for, for me, I always tend to score. You know, when there's an option, when there's a choice, if you've got two people on screen, um, like someone who's angry and someone who's scared, I'll always score the scared. I'll always score the fear because that's, I suppose, the anger, the angry person is the person there to get you as an audience member fired up and get you scared. So if you scared, if you score the, the, the fear, then you're playing into what your the director is, I, I presume anyway, if, the way I watch films, how the director is trying to get you to feel as an audience member. I always I always um, score sadness as well. If, I, if there's a hint of sadness in a scene, I will gravitate towards it. Sometimes, and I've had this in the past where, you know, I've done that and a director has said, no, I, I don't, that, what, are you, what are you doing? And I've said, I'm scoring the sadness of that character. Go, oh, no, no, I want, I want it to be scary to, to match this thing. And it's like, yeah. okay, you know, and that's a more kind of, it's, a, it's, it's different approaches. Ne you know, it depends on who you get to direct it as to what you do. I always felt like Ennio Morricone did that. I think he scored sadness, um, you know, in a lot of spaghetti Western films. It's mm -hmm. quite gruesome and everything, but there's a sadness to it that, you know, a whole family is about to die by Lee Van Cleef's hand or something like that. And it's not fear. They, he, he kind of makes it really sad. So you start crying and that kind of thing, you know, it's, mm. that's, that's kind of my approach, I find. It just adds a kind of tenderness to it, I think. Do you think you'd, something you just mentioned, Mark Kearney, do, do you think you'd want to do a Western and then sort of do the music and sort of replicate what he did? Yeah, I'd love to, because what the, the thing that Ennio Morricone did, and it's funny because when you point it out to people, people kind of don't really realise it. He invented a, a sound beyond the big orchestra for a, like a he invented a language that we all use now to this day. That's what what a Western is. And the irony of that is, you know, when we hear twanging surf guitars, we assume that's Western music. It's got nothing to do with Western music. It's got a lot to do with the popular music at the time when he was making those films. And he's kind of basically brought surf music to a Western, even with all those voices like the hoo, ha, ha, you know, sort of surf music used to have ha, ha over the top and things like that all the time. And when you compare it to Dick Dale or something like that, it's like, oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty much surf music. Yeah. And but yet he did it so well that we now assume that all cowboys listen to surf music. You know, it's like it's just. The dialogue for if anyone puts a twanging guitar you people even use it in modern television if it starts to go slightly western they use surf music to let us know it's gone slightly western so he did so well he, he reinvented the sound of the western so brilliantly i would love to do that but with um loads of roland synthesizers and drum machines or something like that you know <laughs> it's like let's take techno to the western you know it's it's it's, it's funny but you know, it's possible to do that if you're mm. skilled enough. And it's the emotion that he brings. The styling is, is mostly irrelevant in music. Do you know what I mean? Style yeah. of music is pretty much like the clothes on the person. You don't make your friends based on the clothes they're wearing. Might be the thing that attracted you to them when you first saw them. Like, I like that guy with the crazy hair. But it's the person that you like. You know, that's your friend. And, you know, that's the, that's the thing with Ennio Morricone. It's, it's the, the emotion that is, is the core to his music. And, and you mentioned about obviously using some of the old synths. I mean, I know you've got an Aladdin's Cave. For you, you're known for your Aladdin's Cave of synths, modern, old, you know, real classics. Um, but do, do you find that modern synths are more complicated? Even, I mean, I don't mean, I mean, they're complicated anyway, because you've got to learn them, but even more so complicated and too complicated than the old, the old synths. No, no, because oh. it's a, a synth is a playground. They are more complicated. They, they do more things, but that's inevitable sort of evolution of the of the of the instrument do you know what i mean because it, you know a synthesizer is essentially a, a scientific playground for creating sounds you know uh, and m sort of m marrying that up as a, with a musical instrument um so you know you've got something like you know the the Korg wave state which is a sort of new synth based on an old wave station idea and Within it, it's so complicated compared to say, you know, like a Moog or, or, or an ARP 2600. Okay. But it's, 
it's complicated in a, in a different kind of way. It's like more options of the same thing, but to, to, to stretch it out in different directions. But then, you know, I say that I'm looking at my ARP 2600. That's got four sliders on it that I've barely ever used. And I've had that for over 25 years. And it's like, I've spoken to um, Tom Ellard of the Severed Heads about this. Um, you know, and he, you know, he's a great sort of synth and sound manipulator. And he said, ah, oh, it doesn't matter if you don't use them. He said, you, the, the, one day the time will come when you need that slider and you'll use it then, you know. <laughs> it's kind of, it's a, you know, it's a set of tools. It's like a chemistry set, you know. It's, it's like you don't use every ingredient unless you're a sort of eight-year-old kid putting everything into a Bunsen burner. But, you know, it's yeah. like, it, it, the complexity doesn't matter as long as there's an immediacy on the top. On the on the surface, you know, so playability as an instrument, and then the complexity is there for you to drill down in. I love synths that can be over complex as long as there's a simplification at the top if you want it. Right. Okay. I like I like a mixture of things though. I've got you know I was, I was sort of looking around me the other day. I've got it's ridiculous, but one, two, three, four, five kind of big, sorry, six big sort of newish digital since you know based on either digital sound generation or sampling um because that's my thing at the minute i'm interested in what the new things are i'm not really interested in the old emulations i don't have to be because i've got the old synths so that's i'm lucky you know um but you know it's, it's just interesting to see what what people do it but it's about interfaces as well with synths because most of the stuff that that these synths do i can do in software Right, you know, okay. but it's something about looking away from the computer screen and having a limited set of tools and having to push the boundaries of those tools to make it do something else that's quite interesting i can't explain why and maybe it's just because i was born in an era where hardware was was the only option you know um I, but maybe that maybe that's because i you know i now appreciate hardware because of that you know but i i um yeah, I like I like mixtures of all sorts. I'm not snobbish about anything. You know, I'll use software as well. Yeah. Do you what software do you? I mean, it's a sort of a random question. What software are you on at the moment? Do you use at the moment? Or you use the same stuff for quite a while? I'm using I use Ableton to sequence, um, and mostly as far as soft synths go, I use the Native Instruments Complete, their big package, and use their their soft synths, which I find particularly good. Um, and that, yeah. that must have been a, a massive learning curve, though, to get into using all the software, then, like you said, more the hands-on sort of stuff with the, the keyboard and the synth and things Not like that. Not really, because no? the evolution of it grew with me. When I first started, you know, I had very limited equipment, you know, a simple sequencer, a four-track tape machine, do you know what I mean, and a few other bits, and a song was finished when everything was making a noise, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, that's it, I can't make any more noise than that, that, that has to be the finish, you know? So you, but you plan your songs accordingly because of that, you know, you make it work. Um, and then, you know, when I had some money, I bought an Atari with C-Lab Creator software. So you learn what it is to be, you know, to work on a computer with a sequencer. And to be honest, it, when I look at Ableton and go mentally go back to, to that, the learning curve was was gradual because it's like tiny steps. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's you know it's like that scene in um, oh god, what film is it? I'm thinking of that came to mind. Um, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, when he's walking up the mountain with massive stairs. You know, but you just take it one <laughs> step at a time. You know, you can do it. You can. It is a ridiculous sort of change from C Lab Creator to you know live Ableton Live Eleven. But you know, you've taken it one step at a time, and it's the same with software since you know when they first started, there was one or two. And so you learn it. And anyway, whether it's software, sort of digital or analog, they're all the same tool. They all work pretty much the same way. You know, it's like when you learn one drum machine, you know how to operate most drum machines, you know. Okay.